Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Danielle Kirchmar. I'm the um, curator here at the RSM Gallery at Bentley at the library, and we're so happy that you could all make it out on this evening and glad that we don't have any snow to contend with as you're <laughs> driving to and from. Um, I have known Brad through like a fam family group is in Somerville, but this yep. summer he presented this body of work at the Somerville Library. So we're always getting information <laughs> from libraries. Our library. libraries have a strong partnership. And at his presentation, he talked about the inspiration for this work and his work with archives as, um, as part of his process. And that struck me as such a powerful connection to bring here to Bentley to a gallery that is in a library. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Brad. He's earned his MFA at Hunter College, his BA at Wheaton College. He's won the Pollock Krasner Foundation grant for his work and has been granted residencies at Yaddo multiple times and, Mac and McDowell. He's shown his work at MIT, the Boston Center for the Arts, the Milton Art Museum, the Tufts University Art Gallery, among many others. And his work has been reviewed in the Paris Review, National Public Radio's Weekend America, and the Chicago Reader, again, amongst others. And um, I'm just looking forward to hearing him speak and tell us more about his process. And I want to thank him for joining us here tonight in the library. And thank you for coming. Thank you, guys. Thank you for coming out. Wow. Sounds so impressive, doesn't it? Um, can you believe it, though? Any of that? Can you believe it? Um, so I am Brad Johnson, and I am responsible for this work. Um, but I stand on the shoulders of giants like Danielle, who offered to have me come out and show this work. And uh, so thank you. Thanks to the university for having walls that I can put it on. And mostly thank you for coming out. Um, it's a huge gift for me. I've been working on this for the last two, three years. This is the first time it's ever been put up in mass. It's been in bits and pieces in my studio. So this for me is really exciting. And you guys complete a circuit for me as an artist, somebody who works alone. This is what it's, what's most important to me is this kind of conversation and get your feedback. So thank you. I really appreciate you being here. Um, I will present the work to you and give you some, some background to it, some of my impetus for working on it. And I would like to maybe also tell you a little bit how I make it. Um, and I'll try to do that in a way that allows us to actually talk with each other. It doesn't monopolize the whole evening here. Um, but I'd like to start by asking you all a really large question, which is how many of you on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on an hourly basis, Find yourself with some, some bit of climate anxiety, climate change anxiety. How does that enter? Oh, I love hands. It's an interactive group. I love it. How many of you have kids who have, let me finish the question. How many of you have kids who, who have that sort of anxiety? Yeah. Yes. OK. So I have both of those things too. I have it in me and I have it in my children. Um, I have two kids, two teenagers. One who is even now probably coming up the steps late, you see? Um, and I have a 17 year old boy who really sees a very attenuated future. Doesn't see much past his generation in fact. Sees the end of the world and measures it out in you know, parts per, per million kind of things. Um, and obviously that's very affecting for all of us when we have people like that in our life and we hold that kind of anxiety. But I'm an artist as well as a parent and I've tried to figure out a way to confront that or at least bring part of this age of anxiety and climate change into my work so I can figure it out a little bit more. That's the work you see here in front of you. Um, now, this work has, um, as you see, landscapes in it. And that, the, all the work you see here is 19th century um, landscapes. Oh, this is my wife. <laughs> you guys, let's have a round of applause for my wife, <laughs> Jackie. 
and Annika and Paige. Um, so the work you see here, all the work you see up here, all the imagery that you see up here is from the 19th century, early 19th century, late 1800s, early 1900s. And this is what the Mystic River sort of looked like back in the day. Kind of looks bucolic, right? Sort of nicely framed for the most part. It looks bucolic. Um, it was not. The Mystic River was, uh, was a sewer. It was a, a toxic, low trickle marsh that was dumped in by um, industry, paint companies, and tanneries. It was also the sewage discharge from the communities around it. It was seen as a really nasty, gnarly place. It had malaria in the summer. People complained about it always. And so I got really interested in these old photographs I was looking at of the Mystic River. And I realized that the Mystic River I know, that's in my backyard more or less, where in Somerville, is so different. It's a beautiful green jewel that runs through an urban landscape now. And I started wondering how it got to where it is now. That led me down a long road of thinking about time, about individuals who contribute to things, all the kinds of things that climate change to me I have no control over as an individual. Let me back up here a little bit and tell you that when I was, um, about 15 years ago, I was given the opportunity to, uh, to participate in a show, a juried show at MIT called Two Extremes. And the idea behind the show was to bring scientists and artists together and craft public art pieces that would bring awareness to climate change. This was 15 years ago. 15 years ago, right, there were a lot more climate denying that was going on. Um, and it seemed a lot more distant than it now. It seems so, so much more present. I, um, my project involved putting up signs all over the beaches of, of uh, Cape Cod and the islands. And it was a great project. It was very energizing. There were people that were involved that were helping me. I felt like I had finally found something I could do as an artist to engage with this problem in a very direct way, as an individual. At the end of that project, at the end of the summer, I came back to my studio and I realized that I was really disappointed and I was really despondent. And I couldn't figure out why that was. And as I thought it through, I realized it's because my whole art project was based on getting people to feel anxious and getting people get in touch with their fear about, about climate change. And I did it on beaches throughout Cape Cod during people's vacations. I mean, that's... <laughs> so I went back to doing what I always do, what I've been doing for 30 years, which is this, what you see around you. I, my project is to take photographs, old photographs, and paintings and bring them close enough together that they read as the same thing or they read back and forth. Um, so that when you look at these images, maybe from a distance, they look very photographic. If you come up to them, you realize they're made of medium, they're made of some sort of handmade quality to them. And a photograph, as photographers know, a photograph is often seen as a document, right? We take pictures of stuff and we refer back to birthday parties or, you know, things we've done. And it seems almost objective, right? We take these snaps of things. I love that objectivity of a photograph. It gives it a kind of a, a truthful quality in our heads, anyway. Now, painting is something very different. Painting has a different memory. It's, a, it's the memory of an artist who has worked over it over time. It's the memory of affecting something. And when you look at one, you scan it differently. You're not looking at a painting as this kind of document of some past, even though it is a photograph of it's derived from a photograph of the past of a particular moment. So the process that I have engaged in to try and do this, I'll tell you a little bit about the medium that I use, is on these panels, I use a silk screen process. And I won't bore you with the particulars of that, but a silk screen is something you can transfer a photograph to. You have a template, almost, of a photograph of this 
event. It's a second or third hand event at this, or uh, document at this point. And what I do is I take these, um, these silk screens with paint and I, I, I you know, put it across a panel. I put these, um, what's the word, squeegee it across a panel. And as it dries, I work back into it. So there's handmade marks and there's things that I do to it. Once it dries, maybe I scrape it back with a bit of a, um, a razor, something like that. And then I put a clear coat of acrylic across it, very thin. And then I repeat the process over and over again. So when you're looking at these, these paintings, you're actually looking literally into, deep into a painted event that I've made. That's kind of the way I, I think of it. These are layers that denote time to me. Um, they're strata of things. Um, the other thing that you'll notice pretty obviously is that this work is cracked. It's got this cracked appearance. And you might think that I just haven't taken care of these paintings. That's not true. <laughs> um, what I do is before I actually paint this work, before I put these, this paint down, when I just have a panel, I put a type of a medium on it that when it dries, it cracks up like this. So I paint on this cracking surface. And I do this for two reasons, as far as I know. One is that the, the, the cracks actually take you back into the very bottom of this painting, the very, the very uh, foundation of the work. It, it for me, is um, a way of looking back sort of into time for me. I do it also for the obvious reason that when you look at these cracks, you get this fictional sense that this is old. And the work itself is about this notion of time. As I've thought about time and I've thought about the Mystic River, I've thought how short my own time's attention is, my own span of time, my, my physical whatever I'm going to get, 80, 90 years, I don't know. Um, and, and how, if I cast myself back 120 years to where these people lived, who are so despondent about this river, I can hardly imagine it. I have the aid of these photographs, but I, it's hard to imagine. And likewise, it's hard to consider how those people could have ever thought that the, that the Mystic River would be what it is today. There's something about that that gives me a little breathing space when I consider climate change. It's not the same thing, of course. This is a river, and we're talking about a global problem. But these paintings have been my attempt to find some breathing space in considering time and considering how you, how you, um, how you perceive what is an end and, uh, and what is a beginning. When you look at the imagery in this work, you have a lot of different things besides the landscape. You have, um, you have pictures of the time, you know, these guys, these are guys are alewife, they're fishing for alewives in the Mystic River, which were eaten. It was 1930s, I think, that, that photograph was taken, 1920s maybe. So they were pulling alewives out of this river, that was still pretty horrible. Um, you have images of flora and fauna that, would, that have come back to the alewife that had largely disappeared. Um, you have deer, which are now our friends. They live everywhere, don't they? When I got out of my car, I saw deer tracks right, on, right by my car. Yeah. Um, and also, there are images of, uh, of biology, microscopic biology, um, with, that are within the river as well. Uh, there's, there's women who, uh, who have these wonderful hats, the fashions of the day. These hats actually adorned with feathers of birds that at that time, because of this fashion craze, were being driven to extinction at the time. They've come back. The other thing that's kind of odd that, that you probably have noticed as well are, are these strange um, charts and, and uh, illustrations. These are from sects, Protestant evangelical sects of the time, who saw the world as having a very definite beginning, a middle, and a very definite end point. They were apocalyptic in how they saw the world. And the reason I have been thinking about these guys and, uh, and, and interested in them is that the language that is used by these people is the same language you can find in how we talk about climate change. That there is, there is language out there that says things will end, it's over. I don't know if that's true, 
But there is some comfort to me to realize that as I've done my research, every generation seems to think it's the last one. There are elements of every generation. There's an apocalyptic theme that runs through our country in movies, you know, in media, and, and also sort of in our psyches. So I don't, I don't mean to, um, when, when, I, when I think of these folks, I, I don't mean to, to, to look down on them and say, oh, how ignorant. I think we're all caught up in the same sort of thing. Um, the same, the same, uh, the same sort of uh, specific daily sort of projections out into the future that has an ending and must have an ending. Um, so this whole project on the Mystic River is one that's actually going to be a ten-year project for me. I'm partnering with another guy to, to be doing this, and we are looking at other watersheds throughout the country, and this is just the very beginning. I'm really delighted that you guys were here and able to, to sort of um, see the launch of it. Um, I will finish up this, um, this spiel um, by going all the way back to um, my son, my 17-year-old. When Skylar was just a kid, he was that typical kid who was constantly almost harming himself with everything he did. He would climb too high, he would run down sidewalks, out into street, he would, you know, sharpen sticks and poke things. And I would always say, Skyler, dude, you're gonna hurt yourself, don't do that. What are you doing? Stop that, what are you doing? Climb down, get down, what are you doing? And, um, and he would turn around every time and he would look at me and he would say, Dad, you don't know the future. <laughs> which is not what you want to hear when you're a parent, you know? <laughs> but that came back to me, this kid who lived that sort of, in that world that he didn't know the future and now thinks he does. Um, so that's where I leave you with this work. Um, not a panacea, but a question about do we know the future? Do we really know the end of the story? That's all I got. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to answer other questions if I, if I uh, confused you or if you have any, um, any observations. Can I ask a question about process? Uh, sure. How many, when you say layers, mm -hmm. is there a certain number? Do you stop with? Is, what's the most or least you've done on any of them? When do you know it's done? <laughs> kind of a thing, right? When you know it's done, when you're sick of it. <laughs> no, when you know it's done. It really, so th what you're seeing is work that is still not been killed off because I have worked, worked to death. And um, there, there's this weird point that, that comes where you, you're kind of like, if, I can't add anything to this at this point. And if I do, I think I'm going to screw it up, you know. Um, yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, so you start with the cell screen and then there are layers, but some of them are painted? Or, okay. or are they yeah. also just scraped and kind of applied as layers? Okay, this is, this is industry secrets here, but I, <laughs> I will go through this for you one time. Um, no, so what I do, what I do is I, I will, every time I will, I, I will apply paint across with a silk screen and do stuff to it, then I coat it with, a li with this real thin layer and then I work back on it. And what happens is if you put a coat of this, pol this uh, acrylic across of it, you, you can't, get at it anymore. Mm -hmm. So you can scrape back, you can move, mess around, you can mess it up and redo it. I mean, it's kind of, so yeah, thanks for that, yeah. You guys want to do yeah, rocks, rock, paper, scissors? <laughs> he can go ahead. He can go ahead. Okay. I was just interested in your choice of palette because I was looking back at your um, sort of source material mm -hmm. for the Pachuma. Um, and it's primarily in black and white. Mm -hmm. Here you're incorporating color, but a very muted tone and a very like. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about yeah. that decision? Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah, that's pretty. That's, um, so, yeah, the, all of this work is black and white when I've, I'm working with it as source material. Um, there are images in here, that one in particular, the top one, where I've now 
begun to use the old Photoshop process of um, colorizing black and white photographs. Have you guys done that with anything? It's kind of a funky, it's funky. It, it, it changes an old looking picture just by adding color. At the same time, in the old days, people used to colorize, they used to hand colorize pictures. So it, it retains that, that kind of sensibility. So to answer your question, that, that's sort of the direction I'm going is colorizing these images as one more layer of kind of messing with their age. Um, the color is the palette. Um, what you're seeing is, in this work is me trying to figure out what the palette is going to be um, and trying different approaches um, and different treatments. Um, you know, there was everything from kind of that sepia tone kind of thing I was doing a couple of years ago um, to, um, to just this monochromatic sort of green treatment. Um, it's a, honestly, it's an exploration to see what happens when I apply a, co a, a, uniform, a color that is that image. If you look, if you look at the table, there is a, um, there's a photograph in there that is this image with this little rowboat in the corner, this black and white photograph. And I'm, I'm always just amazed at how you change the color of something, of an old photograph like this. It just shifts. So it's really just, it's experimental. I don't have a schema of it at this point. Yeah. It feels very coastal. Your it feels coastal? Yeah. Oh, OK. I buy the color palette. Yeah, OK. Cool. I, that's what I meant. I was painting coastal. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good. Yeah. Did you have a question? I think so. You don't think so? I think so. OK, I'm ready. I really like your work. It's very nice. Okay, stop. <laughs> <laughs> no, what's your question? What's your question? Okay. I, I, I want to, so I am no art dude. I just want to know, like, is this just experimental or there's a reason behind it? Like, the reason you put it? Because, see, I just love art. So mm -hmm. I don't know, like... How did these arrangements come to be, you mean? Or how were the sub, was the subject matter chosen? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, the whole thing, okay. <laughs> so the arrangements, oh, you know what I'm going to do? You're it, tag, you're it. So, um, yeah. Then, yeah, come on, Bob. So I didn't arrange this, really. Well, this that was, one, but this you was not arrangement. I know, but I've been talking for so long. These people, you should see, well, they're glazed over it like this. <laughs> okay, so, so to answer your question about this work, and Daniel will talk about the important stuff that she did. This work was just trying to find a way to um, put together images that seemed to have some sort of resonance to them and that played off of each other. That I have no agenda in terms of I want to make a message by applying things, different things. So it, it really is an aesthetic game of what works, how can I balance something off, how can I make it kind of striking. Yeah, that's my, that's my answer. I'm, stay, I'm sticking with it. That's all I got. That's all I got. But Danielle's got a more intelligent answer about putting this together. I mean, it's along yeah. the same yeah. lines. I mean, and I we did it a little bit together, and then Brad I mean, had had to leave, and I was like, I'm going to still play, move things around, and I did it on the floor. We don't have a magnet wall, so. <laughs> and for me, just looking at, at aesthetic connections too that might keep you know, like that walk you through the walk you through the image and give space to ones that have more, you know, intensity and space for the animals and then finding like fun little moments. And then I was fun little moments where you get sort of a continuity of something that like, you know, it's there, but it gets discovered as you move things around and find different forms. And you know, I like in the interconnection between the elements, like where a bird's wing kind of gets continued in an anatomical, model or something so there's there's so, there's so many nice moments of connection so that's our that's awesome. present in the work yeah so, yeah so that's right how this came together that's how it came together <laughs> and work hard work yeah i just want to say um i love the way your choice of different images just shows so many different ways that humans are engaging with nature <laughs> yeah yeah this this has been a this this river has been worked over and re recharted. And I have to say, I had a student, I talked with a, a, a group of students today, and one of them said to me, so, 
Um, are, you, are there any images here of Native Americans? Where are the Native Americans in all this? So I do have to, I have to kind of qualify this, but that, that, was the, that was me being hit upside the head by going like, yeah, there aren't any Native Americans in this. This, this is the story of, this is the story of photo when photography started coming in, right? Long past the people who got moved off this land. And, um, and it's primarily the story of, of colonial America and that kind of thing. So that's my disclaimer. That was my, uh, that's what today it was interesting. Yeah, sure. Well, kind of related, What's it like in the archives when you're going to look for material? Like, do you, you're scanning things, do you, you see things first, obviously, do you start hearing and feeling, what, what do you experience? What happens? I, usually I'm hunting for particular images. Like, I was, I looked everywhere for this image. I saw this image online, which is crappy, and then I went to the Medford Historical Society, join, give. There's this cute, this cute little society over there. And they're very happy to see you, which is really fun too. I'm like, they're librarians. Isn't there a library? Where's the librarian? Isn't there a librarian? Right, right here. Yeah, come on. They get the job done. Yeah. Um, so it's really fun to go see that. And it, it, what's great about it is you have folks who know what some of the material is, and they'll go like, "Oh, you like that? Look at this. A little bit of that here." It's really kind of a lovely, uh, a lovely. Uh, I, I search online a lot, and I, I go through archives online, but it's way more fun to go to, um, to real places. And uh, now that you know, COVID's over, it's a lot more easy to do it. This work was done a lot during the COVID period, so most everything here was sort of things either I requested from library sources and got or found online or bought on eBay, you know, things like crazy things like that. Yeah. Good question, yeah. Andrew. Yeah, you're in the this the span of Brad Johnson's exhibits that I've been um, you know privileged to see. I, I cannot not see um, a narrative. Maybe, obviously. It's because you're a writer. Well I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, love, I love the question that went went to the three of you. Um, yeah. and it was you tried not to talk about uh, a purposeful narrative, but I, I think precisely in that you, um, regardless of the perspective or the desire, or even just the downright pragmatism to how to put it on the wall, there seems to me always there has to be there's some sense of narrative that emerges regardless. It's you know it's um, it's going to do it when you observe. It. Okay. Precisely by the fact that it's being observed. Yeah. There's a narrative there, and so my my question is. Yeah. If, if I have a question, so is you know is there. Um, in the, in the sweep of what you're hoping to do, you know, do you, do you have a sense of narrative? The question of climate change is narrative. This is fascinating, even though you, you started with, with uh, telling us like a true story about the, the cesspool that was the Mystic River. Mm -hmm. It's not so much anymore. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I guess my question is, you know, there's, is, do, is there a kind of like, hey, let's observe it differently? You know, it can be observed differently, and by that very observation, the story can change. You know, and you can, you know, the the uh, the story about the native, you know, where the Native American. There's a big thing on Radio Boston today about teaching uh -huh. Native American um, history in Massachusetts, uh -huh. and so the, the students are probably um, really switched on to that. And in some ways, it seems to me quite obvious that there aren't any because this is the um, the, the lens, if you will, uh, that has erased that narrative. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, there wouldn't be, but it does. It's not to say that there isn't mm -hmm. no one that yeah. needs to yet be observed. Right. Um, no, that's no, that's that's really that's great. And uh, you know, the Mystic River is a misspelling of a Native American word that's been lost. It wasn't the Mystic River? It was something that sounded like it, but it. Um, and the narrative, you know, the personal narrative in this for me is. Uh, the debate that I have in my head is what if it is the end? What if we don't have so much time? What do I do with my time right now? And where I've landed here in looking and trying to find these narratives and trying to find these, these places and this tenacity of nature, maybe it, maybe it will account for nothing, but it does give me the moment now where I can, I can appreciate beauty. And I can, um, and not to get too woo woo with you guys, but to, but to, 
that, that this is the gift. The moment is the gift. And whatever is going to happen is going to happen. And maybe we can stop it. Maybe we can do things. And we, we, we don't know the end of it. Maybe things will happen. Um, but this Mystic River is just, it's there, for, it's there as a testimony to that something does regenerate. Something does come back. And that's kind of, that's kind of the big, I guess, if I were to yeah. make it a story. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. This is funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So Danielle and I, we were talking about this. It's not maybe necessarily in any of the imagery, but yeah. the idea of uh, you know manifest destiny, because with all the prophetic imagery and the religious references, hmm. it made us think like maybe, or at least uh, I was thinking, you know, maybe like are we kind of like locked in this idea of having to kind of manipulate nature and being responsible for it? As part of like you know the idea of America, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. coming from religion, you know, oh yeah, in the European culture, because right? What the other gentleman was saying about the native culture that was here already with agriculture, mm -hmm. with understanding the environment and how we work with it. Yeah, no, that's right. That's great. I will think about that manifest destiny. That's a really interesting angle. You know, I th I think what's like everywhere in the country. These places are so changed now, and they've been so commodified and used for commercial reasons. You know, the billboards in the middle of the Mystic River. It was a marsh. It was a beautiful marsh at one point, and then it was dammed up and drained and paved over. Um, doesn't look anything like that when you're sitting, standing on the bridge, Medford Bridge, looking up the Mystic River. If you can do that, um, yeah, it's a you know, it's it is about the land in that sense. I like that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Another quick question. Good. Um, the aspect ratios, they're interesting, and it has like this sort of feel almost like a cyclorama, like with that long, huh. like. Yeah. Um, okay. So, I mean, you as the artist have a choice, right? So you have, you've chosen these aspect ratios. Yes. Yep. Why am I doing that? Why? Okay, I'll tell you. Here's the big reveal. So the aspect ratio is based on the silk screen that I use that I can actually have in my studio and work with. There it is. I'm naked. Um, so, so I have a 19 by 13 inch screen that I have. I can't, I can't, um, and I can't, um, I can't develop anything larger than that in the space that I'm in. So these are all roughly 13, 12 inches, but I can go long on them. I can go as many screens as I want down this way. I got you. Do, but you have more than what? Well, it, it's yeah. sort of because they're they're very akin to like a widescreen television and like an old school. Yeah, thing. yeah. Like two so. Or the the pano on your camera, right? Yeah. That kind of thing. That kind of feel. Mm -hmm. And I I admit that I do love. I like that. Look, I, and I like that you're given um, a good swath of some visual information, but you, you really know that you are looking um, at just a chunk of it, a small piece of it. I like that part too. But, and there, yeah. there are, like, there's sort of, like a few, like, kind of, my eyes don't have to collect, like these, like, these, like, older panoramic images are usually often, like, por portraits of large groups. Right? Yeah, but right. Yeah, sort of have those right. So it's so interesting as I was hanging these rectangles, I was thinking about that in terms of that historic yeah. reference in the f in that long rectangle shape too. In terms right. Of the form. Right. That's right. The, the army camps. Are yes. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Group Old shows. baseball teams. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right. That's my next subject. I'm going to do. Nineteenth century is like very prevalent in the nineteenth century. In the nineteenth century. A lot of these yeah. Century, yeah. Like the right. Stuff, yeah. Yeah. Do you guys all know the cyclorama? You know what that idea is? Mm -hmm. No, Rob. I'll tell Rob. He's the only person to know. <laughs> it's a. It's a. It's, it was a circular building. There's one in Boston, right? Yeah. You guys, catch it's me on this. BCA. It's on the BCA. Yeah. And they would set. They set it up so that I think you would come up in the middle of it, but it was a, be a diorama that ran all the way around you. So they do like, you know. Gettysburg, or they do all different sorts of things like that, but pretty awesome. Hey, come on in. It is Come on. Not, not coincidentally, 
but the, the, the subject is a river, so the length of it also has to be mm -hmm. metaphorically with that symbol. Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> that's why you're here. No, that's, that is true. That is true. And, and it does add to this sort of layering, too, right? I'm, the layering of the, as a river, I thought that as a river lays down sediment. And, and to paraphrase Norman McLean, because it's also it's something I think about a lot when I think about your work, are you haunted by water? <laughs> <laughs> I am, but I never step into it twice. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I am very haunted. I, yeah, I'm very, I think water is a wonderful, mysterious, and endlessly symbolic thing to explore, metaphoric thing to explore. Can I ask a question? Of course. <laughs> I just want to know why are, why are you even allowing questions to be asked for you in terms of why you do this? <laughs> <laughs> Why, wait, let me, let me ask you a question. Does that, does that, that bothers you? What, why, why wouldn't people? Well, I'm not an artist, but I have a heart. I put in my heart, I'm like an artist. I know you do. I would yeah. never let anyone question me. It's like, this is my heart. You like it, you like it, you don't like it. It's like, why are you questioning me? I'm being questioned. But see, here's the beautiful thing about, about getting questions and, and talking about it. My little heart is just in a studio all day long. Honestly, You're and bored. so I'm bored. I'm I'm uninformed, and so if if I can have conversations about what I'm doing, man. I mean, I've already manifest destiny is already something on my table, and so are Native Americans. I mean, from this conversation. So, but you're right. Screw you all. This is the art. <laughs> Love it. Healing my anxiety. I don't know if we can heal anxiety. <sighs> yeah. Is it, is it about, it is about, ultimately it is about hope. Okay. It's, at least, it's at least about distraction. <laughs> and honestly, that's what we all do anyway. Yeah. We all got our ending somewhere, you know. So the distraction or the refocusing is, is a refocusing on something that is in, immediate in my backyard, is a part of the, the world I live in, but it's local, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, the conversation earlier about Native Americans and other things, just, I can't take, miss the opportunity to plug. Um, in March, we have an uh, amazing scholar, Lorette Savoy, coming. Mm. She wrote a book called Trace, and I mean, mm. it's a phenomenal book. I highly, the library has it on <laughs> display, so check it out. Yeah. But it, in it, she talks about uh, us relearning and our ability to reconnect with the land. And, yeah. and it just strikes me that in the way you were talking about the cracks and the way you kept going down into the, you know, and documents this being a record of things, right? That the, the record is the land. The, the land record is, is the land. Right? The I land like that. Is there. That's right. And it's our ability to reconnect and relearn the lessons from it, right? Which is... You know, what I see in this is your attempt to, like, reconnect, relearn what mm -hmm. the land has to tell you now, this time. In yeah, a way, yeah, through yeah. the lens of what other people capture through these, you know, these photos and other things like that. But I think it, it helps us in, in my own selfish way. Thank you for helping us to begin that conversation this mm. semester because mm. I hope that people are inspired to do that through your work and then through these subsequent conferences. Conversations, right? Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Will you write my next statement? <laughs> <laughs> that was so eloquent. Thank you. Thank you for that. Read Trace. <laughs> Where did the idea come from uh, to, to use like the book uh, where the, all the theology is laid out yeah. at the beginning and the end? Yeah. Okay. This is where I get naked again. Um, so I grew up in a religious tradition that had that sort of on the periphery of it. Um, not directly in, in front of me or in my, my church that I went to as a kid, but it was there. And it, and it, it profoundly captured my imagination as a kid. So that's the other part of it. I mean, I didn't just arrive at this and go, oh, it's about climate change. I mean, it's, it's part of this sort of thing that I've grappled with on a personal level or, or ruminated over on a personal level. Yeah, and I just, I find, take a look at that book. I mean, I just find the, the, these illustrations so weird and kind of wonderful in a way.
an apocalyptic sort of sense. Yeah. Did you, d over here? Did you, did you? I was you just going to say that I think the composition is incredible. I think it's beautiful and, I'm, and it seems so intentional that I'm surprised that you didn't have a very clear idea about how you wanted to, to place you, I mean, obviously there are, they all relate, they all go together as part of the cycle, but I just think it's, it's really a beautiful presentation. Thank are you. you, is this, are you done with the mystic or are you no. still working on it? No, I'm still working on it. I'm still working and on it. Do you feel yeah, like thank you. Do you want to have a certain number, a certain amount of output, or how, how do you know when this is over and you're going to go to the Hudson or whatever? I'm starting it now. Oh, okay. It's all going to be. It's all going to be. It's happening. Okay. Sort of. It's going to. I think it's going to branch out like a river. I think it's going to. There's different pieces to it. But to answer your question, I am sort of Leonard Cohen, <laughs> and this is Jeff Buckley. <laughs> <laughs> She's the one who put it all together. I mean. I'm not Leonard Cohen, by any sense of the there. That is Jeff Buckley. Um, yeah. It's very intentional. I mean, we, you know, definitely. You definitely, room, you definitely work this baby over. Yeah. Absolutely. It's sort yeah. Of just like, mm hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. Josh? So, uh, as you move to looking at other rivers, I mean, some of these rivers, including the Mystic, I mean, it's being restored, right? There's an active restoration project in Mystic. The mystic is going to look very, if that restoration plans come, if were fully implemented, they look very different, right? You, yep. have, you wouldn't have these trees that you see along it, like above, it's going to look, it would look quite a, quite a different river system. Yep. So I'm just interested, as you move into other river systems and there's this vision that the, the restoration of these rivers has a creative, there's a creative vision behind it, there's a, there's a creation to that that's you know, very informed by science, but also you know, has a, almost an aesthetic or mm -hmm. you know, ecological aesthetic view. I'm just interested, is that something you're, you might be interested in capturing in your images, or is it looking kind of backwards always, or is there maybe a future look in through your conversations with mm. re Watershed Restoration? I know you've been yes. talking with the Mystic River Watershed Association. Is there a way to, are you interested in kind of incorporating that into your vision, what it might look like? If fully restored or not restored or further damaged, wow. is that something? Yeah, no. I don't know. <laughs> That's a great question. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm these. So this image in the green one over there in the center. Yeah. That's I took that last year. That's my picture. Yeah. So I've begun around the edges trying to see what it maybe looks like now. But I haven't. I haven't thought about that. Um, I'm working on a on a river system system in Queens, New York, called. Um, Flushing Creek. Sounds like what it is. <laughs> and they're going to build, as they're doing in New York and a lot of places, they're going to build a, a big high rise, you know, they're going, to, they're going to restore it by building on it too. Um, and I'm, I'm, I, I'll think about it. Because there's all these plans for it. It's, they're all out there, man. I have people for you to talk to. Okay, all right. <laughs> oh, I see how that works. <laughs> so in your works. Okay, cool. No, it's a great idea. All right. Okay, are we, we sort of tapped out, people? We're done, right? Okay. Thank you. Oh, Thank you so much for coming out. <laughs> Danielle? Do we, have, we have food and drinks out there. We'll un, uh, take the paper off so that the students don't. <laughs> so we can so, eat it now. So, and we're just going to move a few of the chairs out so we can please, like, yeah, walk around, enjoy the work, continue to um, ask questions of Brett. <laughs> Thank you I'll answer any questions you have. Thank yeah. you. Thank you guys. Yeah. Hey, you made it. All right.